I never carried a revolver, being afraid that if I lost my temper, I might use it against my own people. So my only weapon was a walking stick. Hi, I'm Kylie Jessner, the Army Vet, and today I'm reacting to another Sabaton video. I recently reacted to the Unkillable Soldier music video, so today I thought I'd go ahead and react to the Sabaton history version. Let's get to it. Hello everyone, I'm Joachim from Sabaton. And I'm Carson de Viart. And he is the Unkillable Soldier. <laughs> He does look like him now, Indy. Adrian Paul Gislan Carton de Viard was born in 1880 in Brussels, Belgium, to a family with substantial connections. One cousin was a former prime minister, the other a political secretary to the king. It was even rumored that de Viard was an illegitimate son of Leopold II. His father, who practiced international law in Egypt, hoped that his son would follow in his footsteps, but de Viard had different plans. After he failed his law preliminaries at Oxford, he chose to enlist, to live life rough and tough and full of bitter experiences. And he didn't really care for what he fought or even for whom. In his romanticized vision of the war, he considered serving the British Empire or perhaps serving in the French Foreign Legion or even fighting for the Boers against the British in South Africa. This ambivalence was caused by his rather youthful ignorance when it came to world politics. I know that the ideal soldier is the man who fights for his country because it is fighting, and for no other reason. Causes, politics, and ideologies are better left to the historians. Well, he first fought with the British against the Boers in South Africa, as it turned out. Because he was still underage and a foreigner, de Viart enlisted with a fake identity. The British recruiter didn't look twice and assigned him to a yeomanry regiment. Arriving in South Africa, de Viard got a first glimpse of what modern war was actually like. A group of entrenched enemy behind offensive barbed wire proved almost impossible to dislodge. De Viard volunteered to dash forward to remove said wire, and his more level-headed colonel denied the request, called him a fool, and most likely saved his life. Broodingly, de Viard conceded, war was still eluding me and my vivid imaginings of charging boars single-handedly and dying gloriously with a couple of posthumous VCs were becoming a little hazy. VC is the Victorian Cross, which is Great Britain's highest award for valor. It would be equivalent to the United States Medal of Honor, but I think the VC is actually more difficult to actually earn. His wish to die in battle was nearly answered when he received a bad stomach wound and a bullet straight through the groin. De Viart oh. respectfully admitted that the Boers were indeed very good shots. He would survive, but his identity was revealed, which got him sent back to England. Although his peers at Oxford celebrated him as something of a hero, Carton thought that it was not possible for anyone to have had a duller dose of war, and I returned bereft of glory. With that strong desire to experience the excitement of war, de Viard decided to continue his adventures with the British Army. On July 23, 1914, he boarded a ship bound to fight the rebels in British Somaliland just a few days before Europe exploded into the Great War. The irony was not lost on him. It seems extraordinary to think of my utter ignorance of world affairs, but at that even then pregnant moment, I fondly imagined I should be one of the few people to see a shot fired in anger. And I could hardly believe my ears when at Brindisi or Malta we heard that Germany and Russia were at war, and my cup of misery overflowed when on arrival at Aden I learned that England also had declared war on Germany. Stuck in a sideshow to the great conflict, his war was now against the mad mullah, Mohammed Abdullah Hassan, who challenged British rule with the support of his dervishes. De Viart fought together with Indian and Somali troops to quell the rebellion. In November 1914, by a well-fortified blockhouse, De Viart and the Somalis advanced as far as they could, close enough that he could touch the dervishes' rifles in the loopholes with his walking stick. Trying to get Another glimpse of the defenses, de Viard was hit. 
The splinter buried itself in his eye. A few moments later, another bullet exploded, hitting the same eye. Although he was basically blind with pain at this point, he refused surgery, knowing that that was his one chance to get back to Europe, eye or no eye. His plan worked. He was sent back to England, and on January 3rd, 1915, his eye was removed. They just mentioned the Somme. That was one of the bloodiest battles of all of World War I, or maybe even in human history, actually. Motorhead did a song called 1916 on it, and then a few months ago, Sabaton actually did a cover of that song, which is one of my favorite videos and songs they've ever done. And I did react to that, and I'll put a link to that at the very end of the video. The Viart's request to fight in Flanders in the Great War was easily granted as everyone was in dire need of experienced officers by then. The only problem was his wound. British High Command did not wish the Germans to think that we were reduced to sending out one-eyed officers. After agreeing to wear a glass eye, he got his papers signed, but then tossed the startling, excessively uncomfortable glass eye out of the window of his taxi and replaced it with a black eye patch, which soon became his signature. De Viart found that fighting in Somaliland was nothing compared to this war. Curious more than anything, he made his way to the front line as the shelling increased. I was standing next to my second in command, wondering what to do, when he said, I wish you'd duck when those shells come. I was on the point of telling him that I was a fatalist and believed in the appointed hour when we heard another shell coming and he ducked. The shell burst quite near us and I was thrown some distance. I picked myself up and started to move my men when I noticed a hand on the ground. The hand was encased in a special kind of leather glove, which I recognized instantly as that worn by my second in command. His body was 30 or 40 yards away. De Viart continued along the bombed out men in road but when they passed some dead Germans, he thought something was off. There had been no reports of the enemy breaking through in the region. But before he could finish the thought, the silence was broken by a torrent of German fire. De Viart found himself flat on the ground in a pool of blood. His hand was a damaged, gory mess. He got up and ran like hell through the storm of bullets back to the lines. My hand was a ghastly sight. Two of the fingers hanging by a bit of skin, all of the palm was shot away and most of the wrist. For the first time, Ew. and certainly the last, I had been wearing a wristwatch and it had been blown into the remains of my wrist. Oh. I asked the doctor to take my fingers off. He refused, so I pulled them off myself and felt absolutely no pain in doing it. By December 1915, De Viart was sick of surgeons trying to save his hand and had it cut off. After his health returned, was back to the war. With one eye and one hand, he attached himself to the infantry. Fighting in the trenches made de Viart realize just how important the role model of the well-behaved and disciplined officer truly was. His own deeds could make or break morale within a regiment, even if it meant exposing himself to great danger. An invisible commander was not a source of inspiration. At the same time, however, it made de Viart a pitiless and unforgiving man who valued duty over personal fears. I was looking around our trenches when I saw a man who was certainly not going forward. I asked him the reason for his dawdling, and he replied that he had been wounded three or four times already and simply couldn't face it. I told him I had been hit oftener than he had, but still had to face it, and to give a little point to my argument, I gave him a push in the right direction, and on he went. I never carried a revolver, being afraid that if I lost my temper, I might use it against my own people. So my only weapon was a walking stick. <laughs> this says so much about him. He had one eye and one arm, no weapon, and just a walking stick fighting in these trenches. It does not even seem like that could be true. As he just said a few minutes ago, he thought himself as a fatalist. And I think the best way I can try to uh, explain that is that already saw himself as dead. 
Just like Cat and Spears said in Band of Brothers, as soon as you realize that you are already dead, that's when you can become a good soldier. At the Battle of the Somme, De Viard was to attack La Boiselle, one of the strongest German-held positions. On the morning of July 3rd, 1916, he led his men. As De Viard described it, dead everywhere, not a house standing, flattened as if the very soul had been blasted out of the earth and turned into a void. By nightfall, nearly all of De Viard's accompanying officers were either dead or wounded, and he found himself in a most unhealthy spot and a magnet for shells of every side. He was suddenly knocked to the ground. Bleeding profusely, he checked his body and found that the whole back of his head had been blown off by a machine gun bullet. Luckily, it had missed all vital parts, but once more, he was brought to the dressing station. I like the song and the lyrics. After three weeks in the hospital and receiving the Victoria Cross for his actions, he was once more back at the front. During the battles of Arras and Passchendaele in 1917, de Viart could see how the British Army had progressed. Now it was their artillery that dominated the battlefields, and shells were available in abundance. But that did not mean he was out of danger. Once more, de Viart found himself caught in a German barrage. His clothes blown into his hip by an exploding shell, the wound went septic. Yet, de Viart pulled through. By now, not only his doctors, but also the general staff urged him not to return to the front lines. Only de Viart's personal appeal to General Hubert Goff got him back to the front, just in time for the German spring offensives of 1918. The Kaiserschlacht badly mauled the British, but the front held. Thanks to de Viart's magnetic personality, he found himself once more in the middle of heavy fighting, when a large piece of shrapnel buried itself in his hip, very nearly costing him his leg. Returning to hospital for surgery, de Viart found out that his fame as the unkillable soldier had spread. I was lying on a stretcher feeling extremely bad-tempered and disgusted with my last brief stay in France, when a well-meaning clergyman came up to see me. Seeing the disgruntled expression on my face and my one eye, he told me to cheer up, as it might have been much worse. He had such a cheerful fellow through his hands a few months earlier, a man who had lost both an eye and an arm. I asked him the man's name and he said, General Carton de Viart, and seemed quite hurt when I lost interest in the conversation. <laughs> that is so funny. I can't. It seems like him getting injured is just more of an annoying inconvenience than anything. I mean, he is just angry that he is having to sit or lay in a hospital bed and he's not able to go fight. And that story with the priest. Oh, my gosh. And once more, de Viard returned to the war in October, but this time only to witness its conclusion. The armistice brought a momentary thrill of victory which soon faded. I think only the civilians get any real joy out of the end of a war and the release from the strain of eternal waiting. Frankly, I had enjoyed the war. With the war ending and the men going home, de Viard wondered what peace would have to offer him. But the adventures of Carton de Viard were far from over. Oh, not yet. After the armistice, he was part of the British mission to Poland, soon at war with Bolshevik Russia. In Poland, he would also see the beginning of the Second World War, where he fought in Norway and uh, Yugoslavia, was POW in Italy, later sent to China, and all of that you can look up for yourselves. Today was simply the great war story of the unkillable soldier, Carton de Viart. He actually tunneled out of the POW camp, and he also survived two plane crashes. And this is footage from the actual music video, which they okay. reacted to also. We're not going to talk about the history behind the man now. We're going to talk, no. about, talk about the video, right? Yes. They've just seen bits of it. It's me in a video with you for the second time. Yes. Okay, talk about the video. The video is a great video. You should watch now. Bye-bye.
No, we we went we went down to to Belgrade, to just outside of Belgrade, uh, last summer, summer of 2021, to shoot the video. Warm. Uh, And you notice I'm wearing a wool uniform, and it was 38 (laughs) degrees Celsius outside, which is 100 Fahrenheit. In the shade, and we were recording in the sun. Yeah, but to be fair, the director was very cool about if you were outside for more than 10 minutes, he'd, like, make me go off set and go inside so I didn't die, so I could do (laughs) do other things. Now, one thing I really, really, really like... Okay, the second best thing about the video... The third best is that I'm in it. The second best, <laughs> second best thing is that you guys are the Germans. Yes. Which to many people is the bad guys, although as we know from watching our other episodes, in the First World War, there were no good guys and bad guys. They were just political and, and, and ideological enemies. It wasn't like, I mean, the Second World War, you, can't, you couldn't make up a, a better bad guy than Hitler. You couldn't, no. you couldn't create better. It's the first easy World War is very black and white. Yeah, well, that, there. I mean, sure, there were plenty of Allied atrocities in the Second World War. It is a world war involving hundreds of millions of people. First World War was a bit different. So you guys are the Germans, which, of course, Americans be watching would say you're the bad guys. <laughs> but the best thing about the video is Tommy's mustache. Yes. Oh. In fact, I want to have a band called Tommy's Mustache. <laughs> So, tell, do, do you remember when Tommy was asking for the mustache? Do you remember the, the day, how, what was going on there? Because yeah. this is me interviewing you. You're supposed uh, to be talking. Okay, about sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I don't remember exactly. <clears throat> but I remember we had to change the mustache. Well, because, uh, you know, I, I got the mustache to be Carson de Viart and, 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 and the fake eye. It's a good, good thing he didn't ask for a shout out eye. And Tommy is like, he said to the director, can I have a mustache? And the director's like, mm, no, no. Can I have a mustache? <laughs> and Tommy's no, I'm in the band. I, I, I want a mustache. <laughs> I want a mustache. And Tommy, he, he looks like a really mean 40-year-old German father <laughs> whose daughter you're going out with in that mustache. Can we get a, can we get a shot of Tommy and the mustache from the video right here? <laughs> now, you do remember, they did want you to wear the Stahlhelm. They want you, wanted yeah. you guys to wear the German helmets. And what did you say? Fuck no. <laughs> and why did you say that? Because they look ridiculous on us. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. I mean, you know. We didn't look, we simply, we didn't want to look like shit. And they talked about uh, where we were in the timeline of the video. And at a certain point, we thought, hmm, there are quite a few other historical inaccuracies in this but script. But Stahlhelm would have been okay. Stahlhelm, because yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm the historian. Stahlhelm's were. I, I know they would have been okay. But they wanted it, us to have them for the historical accuracy. All and right. we thought... Trust me, that ain't going to make a difference. We are going down something really. <laughs> I wish you had said, trust me, we're using Tommy guns, which didn't come out till 1919. Yep. So, but none of us said that because it's not a documentary. No. Now, whose idea was Good it point. that you guys were going to be the Germans? And is that, was that the plan from the beginning when you thought of the whole song? Uh, uh, no, not when we thought of the song, but I think it, you know, we sort of... At the same time, we were discussing which songs, because, I mean, when we wrote the songs, we didn't know which ones are going to be the singles or the right. video tracks. That sort of decided once you're almost done with the album production. Right. And we thought it's a bit of a different song, and we thought we had a good time when we did uh, Seven Pillars of Wisdom with you. Yeah. And uh, we thought, hmm. Oh, okay, wait. Good time or good time? We had a good time <laughs> when we were actually filming. We had a terrible time in Sahara, and you guys almost died in a car wreck. But, you know... Happy memories. Yes, great uh, times. So, oh, okay, we did better in Serbia. Yes, yes. Okay, carry no, on. No accidents. Okay. And uh, we thought, well, it's a, a time, you know, to tell the story of Adrian. Yeah. We can't tell that only in World War I, but it is sort of the craziest story. I mean, if it, if it wasn't true, no, even if it is true, nobody would believe it's true, you know? Well, I don't if think people were... realize that last line at the end of the video, that, frankly, I had enjoyed the war. Yeah. Uh, he really wrote that. Yeah. He was wounded like eight times in the war. <laughs> Blown up again and again. And before, and after. And yeah. after. But it was uh, quite liberating, actually, because it's one thing about being a subathon. We usually, we don't take ourselves serious at all. Right. Usually the stories. But in a sense, I figured if there's one guy in history who can take us goofing around a bit with <laughs> it. It's <Carson laughs> de Viard. Adrian Carson de Viard. I don't know why there's not been, like, a, a massive movie made about Carson de Villard. Well, actually, the one thing, the movie that I would like to write is, is uh, actually, uh, what was first really brought to my attention was the Sabaton song was The Last Battle. I would love to see a movie 
on his story. But because of the scale of his exploits, though, I don't think anyone would believe half of what actually happened. So they would have to make a movie like Hacksaw Ridge and actually scale down what he did. Because if not, then audiences would not believe it. Uh-huh. That would be well, that. I mean, that. When you actually have, it's 1945, you have Americans and Germans fighting together. You got my attention. You, got, <laughs> you, you totally got my attention. So it's been a long time. Um, long, lonely, 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 lonely time. <laughs> See what I did? Um, and I thought, you know, because I we haven't actually filmed together in months, and I thought something that, that you really like. Uh, I wanted to end the episode. Ah! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Screaming eagles. So he did that for the Sabaton History Screaming Eagles video, actually, which I reacted to. And I can put a link to that down below. Part two. <laughs> See, I knew I'd get you with that. So. Oh, fuck. Is anybody else who's watching laughing as much as me? Because I don't know. I just find this whole thing hilarious. I'm going to say the same thing that I did when I reacted to the music video to this. It would be like if you took Larry Torney, the soldier of three armies, and you combined him with the Black Knight from the Monty Python, the Holy Grail. It's just a flesh wound. This is who you'd get. He was just born for war. War was his happy place. If you do want to watch more on Larry Torney, I have a video for you right here. Thank you guys for watching and please smash that like button.